You may be seated in heavenly places. The word of God shall stand. Heaven and earth may pass away, but the word stands. The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. So we've been talking about signs of the end times, and one of the things I need to establish is that you cannot go to heaven or to hell and see people alive on earth either in hell or in heaven when they are alive you can only see people dead in heaven or in hell when i went to heaven i didn't see anybody alive on earth there when they show me the city of my grandfather in the faith t.l osborne he wasn't there at that time he was on earth he was alive so i didn't see him there i saw his city tell somebody don't let anybody fool you by their dreams the bible says absent in the flesh present with the lord and judgment doesn't take place in hell judgment does not take place in hell where you go and spend your eternity is only determined after you are dead not when you are alive and nobody's dream or prophecy or vision determines the end of a christian life it has to do with your personal relationship with god and is based on scripture And the word of God is above dreams and visions and revelation. So let nobody deceive you. Eh? Let your walk with God be based on his word. Amen. Not on dreams and visions and revelation. John the 17th chapter and the 19th verse. I want us to look at some few scriptures. I'm talking about judging yourself so you will not be judged on that day. And what it simply means is examine yourself. You know, self-examination is very important and healthy for healthy Christian living. Bible said, let every man so work out their own salvation with reverence. With reverence. Every man working out their own salvation with fear and re uh, trembling. The word fear here means reverence and trembling, which means don't take grace for granted. Don't devalue your salvation. I mean, we live in times where people will allow money and success to take the place of their salvation. People will choose to change their faith and commitment for God, you know, for money or for anything. If money can buy you and your salvation, I pity you. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man to gain this wealth and lose his soul? There's no amount of money and wealth and success that can be given to me in exchange of my soul. It doesn't work. It's impossible. It's impossible. My salvation is too important to me than money and success or power. But we live in a generation where it is money and success that drives people. Make it at every cost, by any means. Just make it. And if you are successful, society will celebrate you. Society will accept you no matter what. They don't care how you made it just make it but God cares about the way we made it God is not just interested in our success he's interested in how we got it the how did you kill to get it did you destroy somebody to, to get to where you are how did you get to where you are you are successful how did you become successful is the means and the how God does not judge our action he deals with motives because actions are products of motives. So the motive for which you did what you did, you have the biggest church in town. It's good, it's fine, great. But what means, vehicles, did you use to obtain that level of success? That is what God is going to judge. So don't be too impressed with what impresses everybody. I'm not easily impressed because I've seen a lot for the past 40 years. From 76, I've been preaching. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And not too many things impresses me anymore. John 17, 19. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, uh -huh. that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So the truth is, is what sanctifies. What is the truth? The word. Of God is what sanctifies. 
Visions don't sanctify. Dreams and prophecy does not sanctify. It is the word of God that sanctifies. And the sanctification of the word of God comes by the preaching of the word. And if we don't preach it, nobody is sanctified. And please understand that even Jesus, who was without sin, have to sanctify himself in order for his disciples to be sanctified. And understand that sanctification has nothing with sin. It has nothing to do with sin. Sanctification is a daily requirement for every believer. And especially for those in leadership. Jesus said, I sanctify myself for their sake that they also may be sanctified. So it's a daily requirement. It has nothing to do with living, being holy. Jesus was holy than everybody. He was without a sin. But he said, even though he's without a sin, it is required of him to be sanctified himself in order for those who hear him to be sanctified. It's a daily requirement for every Christian. It's a good place to clap your hands. It's not like, hear what I say. But don't do what I do. No, it doesn't work that way. You leave it. It's a daily requirement. First Corinthians eleven thirty one. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So the title of my message is judging yourself. Means examine yourself. Examine your Christianity. You know, we don't examine our Christianity anymore. It's like going to see the doctor for a checkup every now and then just to know what's going on in your body. Today we eat, 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 drink, 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 and we never go to check ourselves. By the time something happens, it's too late because you're not checking yourself. You're just living any, any way, anyhow. But it is necessary. Paul said this has to do with the communion, but it's a twofold word here. It has to do with the now and the now after. This has to do with right now, and then it has to do with before we come before the Lord. If we examine ourselves right now and, and, and watch our Christian life, how are we living our life? And, and look at the way you are living your life. Examine your life in the light of the scripture. And ask yourself, am I living according to the word? Am I a child of God? Am I a Christian? Am I living my life according to the details of the word of God? Or am I just living by what I choose to live by? How is your lifestyle? Are you examining yourself? And it is necessary and mandatory that we all, including myself, examine ourselves and see how we relate to God, to one another, to others, people within the church and outside of the church. How do we relate to people? Are we living our lives as true children of God? Are we living as the light of this world or as the salt of this earth? Or we are just living like anybody else and call ourselves children of God. It is not right. We have to live our life according to the details of the scriptures and the promptings of the spirit. I said to somebody the other day, I said, I said, Royalty is restricted, but freedom is given to the masses. Because the masses can break the rules, they can break the laws, and they'll go to prison, they'll face the penalties thereof. But royalty is not allowed to break the rules. It's a luxury that cannot be afforded, it's too much. Royalty, they don't allow royalty to break the rules. They don't expose them to them some things. They don't let them make certain mistakes. So their life is managed. They are restricted. It's like a Nazarite. You are not allowed to do some things. The masses are left on their own to fool and do whatever they want to do. The masses are off the chain. They are on the loose. They break the rules. They go to prison. Royalty don't go to prison. Why? Their lives are restricted. They are guided. They are governed. And that's why royalty rules the masses.
So there is no freedom within respon without responsibility. And let us not insult or abuse the grace of God to think that because we have come, we are saved by grace and we are here by grace. We can live anyhow, treat people any way we want to, do anything we want to do, all in the name of grace. Don't do that. The Bible says, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? I sanctify myself for their sake that they also may be sanctified. If we judge ourselves, means if we examine ourselves, we will not be judged. And if we take time to examine ourselves, every one of us we will realize and we will see where we are falling short. Everybody is falling short with, of something. Nobody is perfect. Everybody is dealing with something. But it's a constant daily self-examination that helps us to live as it is required and expected of us to please nobody but God and God alone. Say, God and God alone. Amen. Matthew, Matthew 24 and the 12 verse. Matthew 24 and the 12 verse. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. This is one of the signs of the end time. Iniquity shall abound. What is this iniquity referring to? There's another kind of iniquity different from this. This particular iniquity is referring to lawlessness in the end time. Lawlessness. People living without values, without conscience, without ethics, without conviction, living by their own rules, not examining themselves, not checking their lifestyle, not caring and checking how they relate to brethren and relate to one another. It takes humility to say, I'm sorry. And if you can't say, I'm sorry, who do you think you are? Because you are right. You can't apologize. That is iniquity at work. And it's one of the signs of the end time that people will get to a place where we become so arrogant that we, you would defend haughtiness and justify reasons for being proud and arrogant and haughty, having no regard and respect for anybody, can't apologize, can't forgive people, treat people anyway, anyhow, and still insist on your right. You don't care what scripture has to say, putting the word of God by the side and doing what you please. Hey, it's caring. But it's one of the signs of the end time because iniquity shall abound lawlessness shall abound where they will call good evil and they will call evil good these are the days these are the days where you have to be politically correct to be loved and to be celebrated turn your bibles with me to revelation chapter 2 and verse 4 Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee mm -hmm. because thou hast left thy first love. You see, some of us, when we came to God, you wished, we used to run to church. You ran to church. Today, you have to fight to convince yourself to even come to church on Sunday morning. For some, they only come to church on Sunday morning. Wednesday Bible studies is for poor people is for ordinary people. They are so very sophisticated and important and so busy. That is the latest word. I'm busy. I, I'm busy. You know, I'm busy. You call some people Sunday morning. Where are you? I'm at the airport. What are you doing at the airport on Sunday morning? At church? Oh, I'm meeting an investor. I have some guests coming. A guest coming Sunday morning at the time when you are going to service. You can't get anybody to meet them send them to their hotel and see them after church for lunch, they would disrespect you and disregard you. Other religions don't do that. The Jews and Muslims and other religions, the time for their worship or service or prayer time, it doesn't matter who you are. You have to wait for them to honor their God or their religion first before they will attend to you. We are not like that. We have no value system. We don't have conscience. There's no conviction anymore. I was in Israel a while ago and 
the guy that was taking us around, he said, I have to leave by four on Friday. And I said, why? He said, because six o'clock is Sabbath. And I don't work, I don't do anything. After six o'clock, I don't work, I don't do anything, I have to leave. Because when it's six, wherever I am, I have to stay there till the next day. They religiously respect their, 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 the rules of their religion. We have no values for anything. Even if we are praying and the phone rings, we'll pick it up because we are expecting a breakthrough. You are engaging God and God is speaking to you and your phone rings and you pick up the phone. Yes, yes. In the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, wait for me. I'm coming. Somebody just call me right now. Father, 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 don't go away. Wait. I'm coming. Maybe this is the breakthrough I'm waiting for. You know, we have a, you can be laughing, but it's a serious problem. And I watch Christians, we have no value system. It just looks like our Christianity is about just here, here. Make money, be blessed, be successful. That is what drives us. Christianity is not about here. I'm not serving God for here. This thing about being born again is not about being successful in this world and having money and being a millionaire or a, a, a business magnet or shake or a mogo or an or oil or an oil shake. That is not about Christianity. Christianity is about life after here. Where are you going after here? And the reason why Christians, when they make their will, they don't leave anything for the church is because they don't believe in heaven. They don't. They don't believe in heaven. I'm telling you. I'm daring you on authority. Because if you truly believe in heaven and you believe in Christ and you believe in the work of God, you will put something in your will for the church. I'm telling you. When men are dying, their last testament, which is their will, reveals where their heart was when they were on earth. I'm telling you. It really reveals if they really love God or not and his work. And loving God is not what you say, but loving God is by deeds, is by action. And if we love God, we'll prove it. We'll prove it. We'll show it. Solomon loved the Lord and gave 1,000 bent offering. So love is not what you say. You can't go and say, baby, I love you, I love you, I love you. If you love baby, show her. Hmm? You love your baby, show it. The Bible said, we love him because he first loved us. And if we love him, it's not what we say, but it's what we do for the work of God. Come on, put your hands together. We are losing our first love. Today the church is driven by success. It's driven by money. Everybody just want to break through, break through, break through, break through. And people are getting blessed in the church. They don't even know why they are blessed. God is not blessing you for your immediate family. He's not blessing you so you can buy a car. Now, there's nothing wrong about having cars. I have cars. You can even have private jets. And God is not intimidated. And God is not offended about your private jets. But God wants you to understand that the reason why he blesses you is not for private jets, but it's for his church. He's building churches in villages. Winning souls, advancing the cause of his kingdom, his business. That is why God keeps us alive. That is why he heals our body. That is why he blesses us. That is why he gives us favor. It's not to take our children to holidays. I'm not saying you shouldn't take your children for holidays. I'm not saying don't take your children to school abroad. That is not what I'm saying. You can take your children to school abroad. You can go to Dubai. You can go to wherever for vacation. But that is not the reason why God is blessing you. He blesses you for his church. He blesses you for his business. He blesses you for his kingdom. Jesus said, I am building my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. He didn't say he's building your business. Jesus is not building your house. He's not building your family. Even though building houses is good, 
that is not the reason why we are blessed. We are the only religion who have misplaced our priority and the reason for our being. You go to Dubai at 4.30 in the morning at prayer time and you see Bentley, Rolls Royces, all the different cars parked there. The poor and the rich are together, praying together at the same place at the same time. We are the only religion. When we get blessed, we have an attitude. When we start making money, we look down on others. We start mistreating people. We want to have a special seat in the church. We want to be treated a particular way because we have money, we've come into success, we have access, we are very important. God has blessed us and we won't build churches in the villages. Our businessmen will not give to the church, but they will give to charity as social responsibility to be recognized and to be praised and for the media to blow it, to prove that you are doing something. Who are you pleasing? When we do things in this church, and we do a lot in this church, we don't make noise about it. Some of the things we give out to charity, I don't even go. I let the other pastors and bishops go. Why should I go? What am I trying to prove? It is God and God alone I'm seeking to please, not man. And if you are the type that wants to be in the good books of men, you've gotten your reward. But in eternity, you have no reward. Because you live to please men and you did not live to please God. Whatever you do for God is between you and God. And it's God that rewards us. And if you are looking for the reward of men, you are in the wrong place. But if you are looking for the reward of God and you are looking for rewards in eternity, you are in a good place and welcome. Put your hands together. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Reading from the 12th verse to the 18th verse. Deuteronomy. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and uh -huh. hast built goodly houses and dwell therein. You see, God doesn't have a problem with us eating and being full and building good houses. Build it. There's no problem. God is not mad or angry with you when you build good houses. But that must not be that which drives you. That shouldn't be the reason why you are serving God. Some of the most wealthiest people in this world, they are not born again. No. But they follow the principles of the word of God. They give to charity. And they are blessed because they are following the principle and it works for them whether you are a believer or not a believer. It works. If you work hard and follow the principles of giving, you'll be blessed. So blessing and money is not the reason why we serve God. If you are serving God because you want him to bless you, then stop serving God. Go serve something else. That is not the reason why we serve God. But when we serve God, he will bless us. But that shouldn't be the motive. That shouldn't be the reason for serving God. It must be about our salvation and our eternity with Christ. Somebody put your hands together. If we don't correct this thing, our children will grow up and our children will think that to serve God is about material blessings. It is not about material blessings. It's about our eternity, where we go from here. And in the next 50 years, we will all go. And where are you going? And what will it be like when you get there? The next 50 years, we will all go. And what will happen to your children after you are gone? What are you leaving behind to make sure that your children serve God even better than you? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? They prophesy in what? In his name. 
So there are people prophesying in the name of Jesus, but they are not using the spirit of God. They are diviners. Astrologers. Soothsayers. Sorcerers. But they are prophesying in the name of Jesus. And it works because the name of Jesus is a key in the spirit. What makes you prophesy and it comes to pass? The name of Jesus. So you can prophesy in the name of Jesus and it will come to pass and you can still be living wrong. And you can still be a worker of iniquity and you can even be fighting the church and be an enemy of the church. But in the name of Jesus, you can prophesy. That's what the Bible is saying. So don't be fooled. When people live anyway, anyhow, misbehave. Take advantage of people. Exploit people for money. And prophesy in the name of Jesus. And say, I'm confused. I'm very confused. I'm very confused. Because you see, he said it and he came to pass. He uses the name of Jesus. He's a thief. He's using the name of Jesus, which is a key. And it works because of the name of Jesus. Go ahead, look at something. Look, look. And in thy name have cast out devils. In my what? I what? It cast out devils. Cast out devils in whose name? Jesus. You know, today people are displaying. They will display that. They will put it on television to display and show to the world that they are very powerful. And that when they mention the name of Jesus... Demons manifest. Things happen. What are, you what are you selling? You have nothing. The demons are not responding to you because you are powerful. It's the name of Jesus. For at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, on earth, under the earth. So take it easy. Why are you selling? Jesus will heal people and will tell them, don't tell anybody. So why are we selling and advertising all this? What, what are you trying to prove? Go ahead. And in thy name have done many wondrous works. In thy name we've done what? Wondrous works. Are you following somebody or going to a church because everybody is going there? Because of wondrous works, signs, miracles, prophecies, why are you going to that church? The churches are growing not because they are preaching sound doctrine or they are preaching the word of God. Churches are growing. They are pulling people who are already born again to join churches instead of going after those who are unsaved. There are a lot of unsaved people in this city. They will never get them born again. They want to find the people who are already born again. You are scattering what I'm gathering. And you call yourself a child of God, it's a curse you are inviting on yourself and on your children. Now, let me show you something. Go to Luke chapter 10, verse 7, 17. Luke 10, 17. I'll show you something. About all the, and those of you in deliverance, hear me carefully. It's not for show. We are delivering God's people. We are helping God's people. This doesn't make you powerful. Look at Luke 10. And, 17. and the right. 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. The demons are subject through whose name? Talk to me, through whose name? So why are we following all these powerful men of God? Because when they call upon the name of Jesus, then the demons are misbehaving. Then we follow them. So they put it on the TV and see people falling and things are happening. And then people, I mean women, 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 women. Manifesting on the ground, opening their leg and they won't even have the courtesy to cover them with cloth. And when people see that, they are all rushing there. What are you looking for? Where are you going? What do you want? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You that work iniquity. So is it possible that people can prophesy in the name of Jesus? Cast out devils in the name of Jesus. Perform miracles, wonders in the name of Jesus. And yet, they are not of God. And Jesus said, on that day, I will confess to you 
that you workers of iniquity. What does it mean? Lawless people. Doing all kinds of things. And yet, getting results in the name of Jesus. Using the name of Jesus as a merchandise. Running the church for money. You pastors and young bishops and prophets, hear me. If you want to make money, don't do church. Go do business. Because this is not about money. This is about the salvation of souls. And if you use this thing to make money, God will judge you. I'm telling you. This is not about money. This is about souls of men and women. And you must have compassion and love for people. That after everything, Jesus will say, you workers of iniquity. What does it mean? Lawless people. You were lawless. You live your life without my word. You didn't do the will of my father. You didn't take heed to the will of God. It was all about what you wanted and how you can exploit people to get what you want from them. And you didn't care about people. You didn't care. It was all about what you wanted. And he will say, you workers of iniquity, I know you not. Now, let me tell you something. That scripture is caring. And it helps me to check myself and to examine myself and examine my motives. To make sure I'm on the right course. Amen. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Difficult times. Trouble. Trial. These are difficult times. Go ahead. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own self. There are people who Sunday morning, they don't come to church. They are busy making money Sunday morning. The reason why a lot of people don't want to join Christianity, don't want to come to our churches, is because they look at our lives and there is nothing to convict them. The value systems are weak. We can be compromised by anything. We have ceased being the light of this world and the salt of the earth. Everything goes. That is what you call lawlessness. Covetous. 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 You are looking at somebody's wife. Covetous. Somebody's husband. You go to the car park and you see somebody's car. You go and stand there. Brother, we thank God for you. Your car is very nice. I'm seeing something in the spirit. Can I pray for you? You are not seeing anything. You are coveting his car. Go ahead. Boasters. 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 Show off. They show off. They want people to see. You know, I was talking about Ora Roberts, about the healing revival. And a young man called Jaco. Jaco had a healing ministry in those days. He was so powerful. He moved the cities, city to city. He packed the stadium. The guy became big. And the media in those days started blowing him up so huge. And this was what they did. They started calling him the evangelist of that time whose tent was bigger than that of Ora Robert. Start building huge tents to compete with Ora Robert. He died at the age of 38 years. Ora Robert died after 90, I think it was 98 or something, 94, 98. And this guy died at the age of 38 and his ministry withered. Today there are people who are competing with other preachers. When it's time for them to build their churches, they don't build according to their size. They want to build a church bigger than Duncan Williams. What are you trying to prove? If you have the money to build, build. But don't build with the thing in mind that you want to prove a point. What point are you trying to prove? That you are the biggest in town. And Jaco died at 38. Or a Robert lived over 50 something years and died at 98 years. He never said anything. It's a matter of time. 
Some people build a church of 5,000 people and they say their congregation is 20,000. Turn to somebody and say, why? Come on, do it like me. Say, why? Why? Something is just wrong and nobody is addressing it. And young preachers and young men are, and then businessmen and women are following gifts. Instead of you to empower the fathers, you are empowering the sons to misbehave and to dishonor and disrespect their fathers. Where people have no regard and respect for elders and authority anymore just because of money. Money doesn't mean anything. God has no respect and regard for your money. He has respect and regard for your love for him, for your commitment to him, not your material things. Please. Proud, uh -huh. blasphemous, uh -huh. disobedient to parents, uh -huh. unthankful, unholy. Without disobedience to parents, unthankful, unthankful. There are people in the church today, they don't know how to say thank you. They can't say thank you. When God uses you to bless them, they don't even want anybody to know that once upon a time, you were used as an instrument and a vessel to bless them. No sense of gratitude. They don't know how to say thank you to their mothers, to their fathers. No sense of gratitude. And I want to speak to the young foundation. Learn to say thank you to your parents. To the children come from school and their parents are sitting down in the sitting room with a guest. And they don't even know how to stop and greet their parents and greet the guests. They just walk to their room on the cell phone. They are chatting. Something is wrong with this generation. Disobedience to parents. Disobedience to parents. To the ch children get up and they marry and they'll call their father and mother and say, I just married. Where? You are married because you went to school in abroad, because you went to Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, Princeton, Yale. So you are married and you are calling me to tell me on the phone that you are married or you bring somebody, daddy, this is my husband. Your what? It can't happen. It's not possible. It can't happen. It will happen. You are not going anywhere without blessing. Blessing is what makes the difference. I said what? The Bible said, it is the blessing of the Lord that maketh rich. Not your education. Today parents think that after you educate your children, that is it. Education is not enough because education does not give them the wisdom of God. Education gives them knowledge, but it is wisdom that gives them the audacity and the capability to apply and to use the knowledge wisely and intelligently. Knowledge is not enough. Knowledge without wisdom is disaster in waiting. Say blessing. Blessing. It is the blessing of the Lord that maketh difference. Ingratitude. There's no attitude of thanksgiving in our society anymore. People haven't learned to say thank you anymore. Thank you. We can't say thank you anymore. It's a sense of ingratitude. There's no gratitude anymore in the church. Even towards God. God does things for us. We don't even say thank you anymore. There is no testimony in the church anymore. No testimony. Because it doesn't matter what God does for us. We, we feel ashamed to testify. Even though giving testimony is glorifying God and showing gratitude to God for what he has done, we don't give testimony in the church anymore. Because people feel they are entitled to success. And that God is under obligation to bless them whether they say thank you or not. Hey, we have fallen. We've gone very far. You are not entitled for anything more than what you have. If you haven't said thank you for what you have, you are not qualified and entitled for something else. That's the truth. 
but it's one of the signs of the end time that children will not even say you to their parents children won't say it without natural affection no more affection in the church there's no compassion anymore we don't care about people we don't care for anybody anymore it's all about us too much selfishness you are sitting in church and the person sitting next to you you see them wearing the same shoes every Sunday and you have many shoes and you won't give them one they wear the same shirt same shirt and you have many and you won't share with anybody no affection no sensitivity no compassion anymore nobody cares about anybody it's like we just appear. The church is not a lecture hall where you bring your notes and you come receive lecture. After then you go back. It's, it's, it's the family. We are a family. We are a family. We are the family of God. And we got to care for one another. You think God gave you the car for you and your children? No. It's for the brethren. And people stand by the road. And we are driving. Vim, vim. We don't give anybody a ride. Now, 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 here, here. I know some people too are some way. When you give them a ride, they sit in your car and they start misbehaving. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. No more long sufferings in the church. We don't want, we have become so principled and sophisticated that if somebody troubles us a little, no, I don't come to church. I won't come to church. I don't want to have anything to do with these people. They are troubling me. Some of you, you don't even want anybody to visit you in your house. Somebody comes to your house. What are they doing here? What do you want in my house? Hey. Hey. You offended that a Christian brother and sister pass by to check on you. I also know that some people will come and check on you to trouble you. I know that too. But don't put everybody in the same category. Okay. Let me finish. Let me finish. Truth breakers, false, Truth breakers. A, false accusers, mm -hmm. incontinent, fierce, mm -hmm. despisers of those that are good, mm -hmm. traitors, mm -hmm. heady, mm -hmm. high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They love themselves than God. They love their vacation. They love their vacation. They love themselves than loving God and the house of God and God's people. It's always about them. And it's not about God, nor the house of God, nor God's people. That is spiritual corruption. Somebody will cry, they'll fast, they'll pray. And God will answer their prayer by bringing you the answer to their prayer. And then because of selfishness and greed, you use it on yourself. And the people needs are not men. Then they go back, God, Father. In the name of Jesus, oh God. And God said, but I've answered your prayer. And they are still crying. It brings a curse. Those of you who hoard, you hold back the tithe. You hold back the first fruit. You hold back things. Because you don't want people to know you are blessed. You are playing games with God. God knows everything about you. And God is blessing you so that tithe can come into the church to bless others. And you hold it back. It, that's why the Bible says you are cursed with a curse. It brings a curse. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Uh -huh. From such, turn away. From such, turn away. What does it mean? They use the name of the Lord, but they are workers of iniquity. And the Bible says it doesn't matter what miracle, what signs, what results they are getting. They can fill the whole stadium every hour of the day. Walk away from them. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, quickly please. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Mm -hmm. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It is too plain 
It takes confusion not to understand it. Revelation 22 and 12, and let us pray. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Jesus said, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me. And every one of us will be rewarded. We will be rewarded for the good things we did. We will be rewarded for the bad things we did. My assignment is to remind you and help you examine yourself and see where you stand before God. You can fool, but you can't fool God. Stand on your feet, please. That word there, I will exchange it someday for a crown. Church, look out for the crown. Oh. There are crowns and there are thrones, different kinds of crowns. And I'm looking forward for those crowns, not even one alone. I'm looking forward to many crowns. And you can have it, and not crowns only, but thrones. And I'm looking forward to rule cities and to rule nations. It's all in the Bible. And that is why I'm serving God. It's not for material things. If it's for material things and for cars and things, I can do anything to make money. But I'm not preaching for money. I'm preaching for my own eternity. And for the eternity of my children. Amen. Please lift up your hands all over this place. For one minute, talk to God on your own. You've heard a lot. Tell God, give me grace to examine myself, to judge myself, my heart, my motive, my attitude. And tell him, Lord, I repent if my attitude doesn't line up with your word. If for any means I've gotten it wrong and I'm serving you for the wrong reason, forgive me. I never intended to serve you for the wrong reason. Help me to serve you for the right reasons. And I know you bless me for your church and your house. Help me to do the right thing. Help me to use what you bless me with for your house, for your work, for your glory, not for myself. Pray. Pray.